example, we also have representatives of, um, of the Caribbean Academy of Science. We have our panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Badenoch, uh, Dr. Giddings, Dr. Singh Wilmot, and Dr. Sean Mills, organizers, of course, of this conference from IPAC Women's Global Breakfast, um, as students and staff of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Mona Cable Campuses, staff from the UE, UWI Scientific Partner Organizations, our honored guests. Welcome everyone to again the Global Women's Breakfast 2024. Now the theme for this year is Caribbean women catalyzing diversity in science. So we are expecting um, to hear how we can promote, uh, catalyze, um, be able to move our research forward um, as we um, transverse through our careers. So I'm just doing a quick check um, if Dr. If Professor Mary Dawson is with us at this time. Okay, so we are going to proceed with our program. So I'm going to um, introduce um, the panelists and they, um, I'll do it, um, I'll call their names and then we're gonna have, I'm gonna give their brief bio and then they are going to give you further insights into their careers um, and more information about their journey to where they are at this time. So we have four panelists with us this morning. We have Janice Badnock. Um, we have Dr. Leslie Ann um, Giddens from Smith Powell College USA. We have Dr. Marv Dean Singh Wilmot from the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. And we have Camille Strong Mills from Johnson & Johnson Innovative Medicines USA. So I'm gonna begin with Dr. Badnock. So Dr. Badnock, she is a senior lecturer in the Department of Biological and Chemical Science and conducts research in the areas of natural products, chemistry and multi-substances of indole and pyrrole derivatives. Oh, wow. In 2021, she was appointed as the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology at the KPL Campus, the first female to serve in this position at the UWI. Um, after, after serving as the Deputy Dean and Chair of the Campus Academy Quality Assurance Committee, mm -hmm. AQUA, for several, several, several years. Uh, Dr. Bad, Badnock, we're looking forward to hear more information. Uh, what was your journey like to where you are right now? A whirlwind, long. Good morning, everyone. Let's start with that. So good morning, everyone. I hope that you're having a great day. It's sunny in Barbados. And let's hope it keeps that up. We're having some Sahara dust, but we keep going. We might have to cough every now and again, but we're going to keep going. So my journey so far in less than three minutes, long and at times because we are in, I hope, a safe space, tiring, exhausted. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, short version, went to UWI back in 1993 as an undergrad didn't really know what I wanted to do, just knew what liked me and I kind of went with it. So I went with chemistry and math and got a degree from UWI in 1996. Was convinced that I could do a better job teaching math in the high schools than what I was seeing. So went into that for two years while I tried to figure out which of these two subjects liked me and I liked and what I was gonna do with it. Fast forward a couple of years, two years of that said enough. Let's let's go off to grad school. So I went to, to Dartmouth College in the US for grad school and I worked under Gordon Gribble, who's a very well known indole chemist. Fell in love with natural products, in particular for heterocyclic compounds. Compliments wow. of Sandra Jarrett, Jamaican, who was um, teaching us part time, I think, at the time when I was an undergrad. So fell in love with this mechanisms and all of that loveliness and then went off and did grad work there. And wow, long five years of trials and feeling up when everything worked and down when it didn't work and having all your emotions tied up into the success of these reactions and then decided I needed to come back to Barbados. So when I graduated in 2003, came back to the Caribbean, not because I had a job put down, but because I had a husband to be waited. Ah. Well, that worked out quite well. 
God is good. <laughs> and eventually an opportunity opened up at the KFL campus in 2004. So I went into that and got thrown into every, I, I tell the story that my first, almost the first week I was on staff at, at KF Hill, I got pulled into this high level ministry meeting talking about science development in Barbados. Now, what does an Indo chemist know about that? So you, you fake it till you make it and you just keep trying as best you can. And then we went on, we got pulled into all types of arenas that were different. And I need to, to share some context. The KFL campus had no females in chemistry when I joined, none. Mm -hmm. And so myself and now Professor Avra Williams came in in 2004, and we were the first two females that were on staff of all males in chemistry. Fast forward a few years later, Peter Gibbs called me up. He was then serving as dean and said, do you want to serve as deputy dean? Now, just to put context for the other UE friends, Cave Hill is year big. So up I went, and that led to another stint as library chair and being on academic board. And then we had Professor Eudine Barato, who was principal. And then she called up again and said, well, I need you to be ACWAC chair. Now, what do I know about this? Let's go use my science brain in an analytical way to get it done. And that led to other roles, chair of the reaccreditation council when we were going through the reaccreditation process. And then I sat down and we were about to change deans and I said, why not me? And that's a struggle that I think many women are faced with. Why not them? Right. They oftentimes they're capable, but why not? So I threw my hat in the ring and was selected. And here we are. I'll talk here more. Here we are. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Badnock. And again, this is a safe environment where we can, um, like I had mentioned, um, take the mask off, not that we are pretending, but sometimes we don't wear the struggle that we go through. And this is a time where we can take a moment to wear it so that persons can see that they may not be the only one that is struggling in their field or in their department and so boost and give information about support systems and mechanisms that are in place to get us to where we need to be. So at this time, we will have Dr. Leslie Ann Giddens from Smith College in the USA. Dr. Leslie Ann Giddens is an assistant professor of chemistry and a natural product biochemist. Her work involves the bioprospecting extreme environments for new bioactive agents, Ooh, always love that when it comes to the environment, and understanding how these microbial secondary metabolites are made. Dr. Giddens is also chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the DII Committee for the American Society of Pharmacognosy. So Dr. Giddens, again, share with us your journey. First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my perspective today. Um, I want to start by first acknowledging that much of my journey in science has been influenced by the confidence that was instilled in me being raised by my Jamaican family and uh, attending a primarily Black science high school, <clears throat> excuse me, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, where most of the students and teachers look like me and we're from the Caribbean. Um, and it was this foundation that I think was key for me to thrive in predominantly white spaces, yeah. the spaces I navigate today over in the States where people who look like me tend to doubt themselves. And um, <laughs> so with this confidence, I applied to and attended Smith College, which is an all women's liberal arts college uh, to pursue a degree in chemistry. For those of you who aren't familiar with what liberal arts colleges are, they're these small four-year institutions, colleges that encourage students to take classes across a multitude of disciplines, including the arts and the humanities and of course science. And they tend to have very small science departments. And it was there that I became not only interested in chemistry, but teaching others. And I realized that 
graduate school was the next step to become a professional in chemistry. And from there, I went to MIT for graduate school, which initially seemed like a very exciting venture, but it was probably the most difficult, challenging moment in my life. And I was there for about six years. And it was challenging for me because I ended up basically changing course and specializing in an area of chemistry I'd never taken any courses in. And um, so I was in undergraduate classes as an, a graduate student learning biochemistry, uh, but I pulled it off and I had a great mentor. And I think that was the reason why it worked out. I trained students in the lab and I took a teaching certification course along with my graduate classes. Those experiences helped me enter or prepare to enter academia. And I continued to do a postdoctoral fellowship after at the National Cancer Institute. And it was there that I begged my postdoctoral advisor to let me teach part-time at some nearby liberal arts colleges. And I think that those experiences definitely helped me land my first tenure track position at Middlebury College, which is another small liberal arts college in Vermont. And uh, almost six years later, I then left that institution to come back to my alma mater, Smith College. And it's here that I uh, help train and support women and other underrepresented individuals in science. And um, many of the students I teach and interact with on a day-to-day -day basis just lack the inherent confidence to exist in these academic spaces and in male-dominated fields. Um, so I try to give back any way I can and become the support network that I was given at such a young age. Wow, I, I do ap appreciate the transition, the changes. And then at MIT, I was, wow, so impressive. And then, but you talked about the struggles with that and that need to return to, to where you, you had started off to give back and appreciate that a lot. Um, next, we have Dr. Marvadine Singh Wilmot from the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. Um, Dr. Marvadine Singh Wilmot is a senior lecturer and a researcher in the Department of Chemistry who has done extensive work on rare earth metals, organic framework materials, and has a strong interest in science, diplomacy, and advocacy as a tool for development. Uh, in 2003, she was appointed a fellow of the Caribbean Academy of Science, um, which is CAS, and also a member of IUPAC Committee of Ethics, Diversity, and Inclusion, CEDEI Task Force. Dr. Mahvudin, we would love to hear your journey. Oh, thanks, Rachel. Morning, everybody. Good morning. I, I hope you have your, uh, my cup of mint is actually finished, um, but it's, it's, it's breakfast, you know, so I hope we're all <clears throat> enjoying some aspect of breakfast. It's a pity we can't all be together, but it's certainly a privilege and a, and a, and a real honor. I am humbled to be in the presence of so many outstanding women in STEM. And I do see some males, which I think in the interest of diversity and the, the global women's breakfast has now evolved to the point where it's about all of us and not just about females. Uh, I certainly would like to see this discussion go to the place where we, we talk a little bit more closely about the problems that we have in the Caribbean, because some of the global problems are not necessarily the exact problems that face us in the Caribbean. And I think that will come later. would like to look on some statistics and be, you know, let this business of catalyzing diversity be evidence uh, driven and not broad brush all of us um, in the same color. But I think the question is really about me and my journey. My journey is very much similar. Um, to so many other Caribbean students who study science in the Caribbean. I have both my 
And I've all of my life, I have gone to school in the Caribbean. I'm a country girl from St. Thomas in Jamaica. I, I, I come from um, Morant Bay End, which is the eastern end, past Morant Bay, past Port Morant. Any of you who've been to, to Portland on your way there. There's somewhere there in the middle of nowhere. You turn off to further deeper into, into rural St. Thomas to a place called Arcadia. I, I, I was at Morant Bay High School by the time I got to sixth form. The only person who was taking chemistry. I was very much inspired by my um, chemistry teacher who actually had a PhD. Um, Dr. Peter Dallenmeyer, PhD, came to Jamaica from Switzerland to avoid, he says, what uh, industrialization was doing to his country. Um, but he inspired me um, so much that even though I didn't have a teacher for one year and the A-level program was at the time two years, um, so we did the exam at the end of two years. I did A-level chemistry in one year with Dr. Dahl and Maya, just the two of us. Got to look on his PhD thesis, and he was making vanadium catalysts, and that was where the inspiration um, began. So I came to UA and did chemistry like some of you who are here, and I see some students in the audience. Um, found that year one of university, very challenging, studying in a country school in Morant Bay, hardly came to Kingston, the capital, um, maybe more than one or two times before I came to UWE. When I came to UWE, was totally in awe by the campus, lost and cried, like so many of you found my way by the time I came to final year um, in a course in chemistry called um, it was Chemistry of Materials, 31N was the course code, with a lecturer called Ishen Kumbakawa, a man who was getting excited about rare earth metals and teaching us about them, got totally excited and decided to do graduate work in rare earth chemistry. Certainly, again, faced by the challenges that continue to plague us. And in my capacity now as a researcher, um, we face major problems with resources. And you got to forgive me, I have that cough, is it, Janice? So my voice is breaking up, but nonetheless, I have to find it to share the story with you. So while we've made some progress, we're still in the same place where equipment is a problem, resources to do science is a problem. And I hear you, Janice, about all of us who are young people um, <clears throat> and young, sorry, young colleagues coming into the academy and being thrusted into these positions of leadership when really and truly we don't get promoted in this business unless we publish. And, and yet we don't have the equipment to publish. We're going to get into all of that. Again, I say we're going to look on it evidence-based and we're going to look at what I am, I am acknowledging Carolina, who is here from the ISC, um, Latin America and the Caribbean, hoping Mary will be here and hoping um, the representative from the OWSD, which, which is connected to TWAS, some of these people from outside, so that we know that we are not just talking among ourselves, so everybody can be free to talk, because there are some people from the outside who are listening who might be able to advance the message. So I went into graduate school with the lasers breaking down as I was probing my, my lantern my materials and had to pull down the capacitor bank, get the Allen keys and the screwdrivers and the wrenches, troubleshoot that thing with the manual, fix it back up and get it to, to work. Um, after a while, of course, these instruments reach the point where no matter how good we are as women at fixing things, uh, we, can't, we can't fix them anymore. Um, so I, I, I also got involved in learning X-ray crystallography. At the time, there was an X-ray lab in the chemistry department, and there was a lot of, I, I spent a lot of time. By the time I finished, the department needed somebody there, and I was kept on. I transitioned into uh, traveling a little bit to learn some more crystallography, went off to Sweden with a program that Dr. Sadler McKnight had. And I have to mention some of these names, you see, because the journey, I, I started with people like Peter Dallenmeyer, Ishen Kumbakawa, but got to mention that the University of the West Indies, particularly, I have to say, at the Mona campus, 
is just is just a nurturing environment. We have limited resources to do research, but quality research comes out. And that's particularly because of the human resources, the talent that we have as, as, as Caribbean people, but also the fact that we I have met certainly in my journey, women like my current HOD, who is Donna Minor Case, you know, I, I became a mother um, just a couple of years after graduate school and taking up my position at UWE. And that's a very important role and something we've got to talk about here as women in STEM, because um, that's part of some of the things that affect us. We are nurturers, we're caregivers, we're mothers, we're wives, and we want to do that. That's a critical role very, very, very well, as well as we do our research and deal with our careers. Our careers are intimately connected to our, our family and our lives. We are public servants, we are educators, we are researchers. And Jenny says, why not me? But then maybe you ask the question, uh, why me so early? You, where is the structure in the region for young people and young women in particular? Um, who have these additional responsibilities with the resources they need to do research. But I have to acknowledge the women and men who have been mentors. Donna Minor Cates, we used to share. <laughs> Dr. Minor Cates advising me because Dimitri and Matthew are similar in age, talking to me about how to juggle, how to deal with Matthew. Motherhood was new to me and being an she academic was also new to me. She different than how you know her, but I don't know if yeah. you know her. Oh. Sorry? Yeah, you can go ahead. I'm wrapping up. Marcia Roy, who is here, another female, who as I journeyed through to senior lectureship, she was the one I was, I never thought I was ready for promotion. I, I just, I felt like by my own standards, I wasn't ready. I needed more publication. And Prof. Mm -hmm. would be writing me every day, Marvadine, put the CV together and send it to me. Let me see it. And, and so there was no established structure, but there were these icons. You know, and, and I have to acknowledge them and I have to say thank you to them. We'll talk some more later on as I got involved in TWAS, especially in 2010, and began to speak not just about the, the rare earth chemistry that I was doing, but about the reality of doing science in the Caribbean. More opportunities open up for me to speak about this with the international partners. So I got involved in IUPAC. I got involved in um, um, Commonwealth Chemistry. And we'll talk some more about all of that. I, 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 am, um, I am excited to share this journey. Um, you have to save some for us for later because I know that you have like a wealth of knowledge. And one of the things that, that was so common with what you said with Dr. Giddens and, and Dr. Bagnot is that mentorship, that support that is needed in order to move up, to get the know-how, the knowledge, to get that push. Um, so we wanna move on to our, our fourth panelist. We have Dr. Um, Camille Strawn-Mill from Johnson & Johnson Innovative Medicines in the USA. And Dr. Camille Strawn-Mills is an Associate Director of Chemistry, Manufacturing and Controls, CMC, and the Regulatory Affairs at Johnson & Johnson Innovative Medicines. She has a wealth of experience in analytical chemistry, which is right up my alley, um, as well as particular methods relevant to the development and, and monitoring of biotherapeutic products. Dr. Um, Sean Mills, your journey. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone. Um, I feel very similar to all these ladies here with their journey. In my case, it was very winding, not knowing exactly what I wanted to do or thinking I knew what I wanted to do. And then as I was going through, realized, ah, oh, you know, what I'm doing now, that's not what I want to do and changing paths. So I did high school in Jamaica and, you know, at the end for CX, for A level, sorry, I studied sciences. My intention was to be a medical doctor. So I did chemistry, biology and physics. Of the three, I will say chemistry was my least favorite. I liked biology more. I gave my chemistry teacher a hard time every class because I was like, I can't see the proof. Biology, you can see the cells. You look in the microscope, you see it. Chemistry, you're telling me about atoms and elements. There's no proof. So I gave my teacher a warm time through high school. 
moved away to, um, to Florida Atlantic for my undergraduate um, studies. I decided instead of doing pre-med, I wanted to do a degree where if I something happened, I could always fall back on it easily. So I did medical technology shortly after, heard about physical therapy and thought that is what I want to do. They had a five-year program. I will do that. At the end, you'll have a master's. Um, and as I was doing it, one of the requirements was doing volunteer work. I went in thinking all this glamorous, you know, you have certain things in your mind about your career choice without much exposure. And I went in, did my first few volunteer hours and was like, eh, this is not what I pictured. Um, and as I was going along, I was also studying for medical school um, to do the MCATs. And as I was doing it, I started thinking, is this really what I want to do? I spoke with others whose parents, you know, family members did medicine and just, discussing you know family time some of them didn't have that much and I was like long term I want a family I want to be there for my children spend time with them so I spoke with my advisor and you know he gave me good advice he was like he was a chemistry professor and he was like why not do chemistry and I was like well you know it's not really something that excites me that much at the time and he was like well if you do chemistry you'll come out no loans you know, you're good at it. You're naturally good at it. It comes easy to you. Try that approach. If you don't know exactly what you want to do yet, it comes easy to you. And, you know, you should try that. So I pursued, um, I went and did my PhD for chemistry, went to University of Florida. It's not sure what area of chemistry I really wanted to do, but, you know, they make you take all the different areas. And analytical chemistry was what called to me. It really excited me. Mass spectrometry was my area of specialty, but at the end, I still loved biology. So with mass spec, it gave me a means of um, a tool to help solve biological problems. So I, my project actually was plant biology, taking the leaves, doing different enrichment techniques, using mass spec to identify substrates of a certain protein family. So that really excited me. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed work, working with the plants, everything. My advisor there was excellent. She actually wasn't my official advisor, but more a mentor. And she helped to guide me for my path. So when I started job hunting, I had various choices. Instrumentation, you know, countries that, I mean, companies that focused on instrumentation, selling the instruments, learning it, teaching clients, that was one option. There was also option at Johnson & Johnson for a full-time position, you know, doing routine testing for their biotherapeutic products, so large molecules, immunoglobulins mainly. And then there was a postdoctoral position that was working with serum samples, pulling the drugs out of serum and testing it to see how, the, how it clears through the body, what changes happen to the protein, and that just called to me. And then I heard blood especially, so that excited me even more for that. So I joined Johnson & Johnson as a postdoctoral fellow, even though I had the options for full-time positions, I decided that was my passion. That's what I wanted, that particular project. And that opened up a lot of doors to me, for me. Um, a full-time position came up, I did that. During that, I worked with analytical teams. So I worked on the analytical teams at first, authoring different sections of our marketing applications for the different drugs we had. And from there, I then said, I want more. I spoke with my manager at the time and said, I don't want to be just in the lab. I want more than in the lab, learning larger process. Where does all this information get used? So then I started working as um, a scientist, a scientific integrator where I led the, the analytical teams. So we have up to like 10 different teams, everyone focusing on the various forms of analytical chemistry and led those teams to work on development of our drugs and seeing, determining expiry, um, just if the shelf life, different things for the molecule. And from there, I said, I wanted even more than that. So regulatory affairs was where I wanted to be in the long term. I identified that just working with different members of my team at the time. And regulatory affairs was where I landed. And that's been my role for the last two plus years. I'm still learning a lot. It's very challenging to jump from I went straight from the chemistry aspect of things and then going into the regulatory side, so which I had no background on besides that um, dossier preparation that I mentioned for the marketing authorizations, reviewing those sections, 
So that was my experience. So currently my role now is in regulatory affairs, still reviewing all the analytical chemistry work, still you know, collaborating with the, the chemistry team, but also collaborating with others for the manufacturing process and then health authorities, et cetera, and working with local operating companies. And I have to say, for the first week of my job, I was in a meeting for regulatory affairs and then the name Jamaica came up and I was like, woohoo, in the middle of the meeting. And everyone, of course, looked at me like, <laughs> okay. But I was like, sorry, you know, my heart is there. And one thing I should mention is that during my journey, when I was done my PhD, I did want to move back to Jamaica, but at the time, job options were limited. So my focus was mass spectrometry. I reached out at the time, this is a while back, there was only, I heard one mass spectrometer in the entire country. And it was a very old version. And pretty much my job options was either teach or you know I wouldn't be able to, to do that what I was focusing on. So that's the reason I stayed in the US and looked around and here I am right now. Still enjoying it, but I tried to come back home to Jamaica you know, at least once a year when possible. I, I do appreciate, thank you so much for that. And I do appreciate um, the common theme as well as not being afraid to get into something that you may not be professionally trained for, but being willing to just dive in and train as you go along and not being fearful of stepping up if you need to. So we are, unfortunately, we are a bit short on time, but we want to fit in as many as que many questions as possible. So we're asking for persons so we're in the audience. If you have any questions, if anything comes up, please type your questions in the chat and then we're going to give time um, for the panelists to address your questions at the end of the session. Um, so we have um, persons in our panelists from both the industry um, and academia and we have persons that are local um, and persons who are currently based in the U.S. They have this um, this issue of um, equality and, and diversity of gender within the work field. Is this truth or is this a myth? Um, I'm going to ask first the persons in the US if they can confirm that for us and then bring it back home to persons um, who are locally. What is um, the current state of diversity in the field region, the institute that you are in? Is this, um, is, is the diversity or inequality in diversity truth or myth? So I, I can start. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Giddens, do you want to go first? Okay. Because you give the you give the the most uh, look. Yes, I'm going to ask if Dr. Giddens can go first. Well, okay. When it comes to gender diversity in chemistry in the United States, I would say that more women are getting degrees in chemistry. Um, maybe like roughly 50% of all bachelor degrees are in chemistry or for chemistry majors go to women. 45%, uh, I'm just, I have some statistics here, I'm just gonna run off. 45% of all master's degrees in chemistry go to women. Um, and then a roughly 40% of all PhDs in chemistry go to women. So that's a very good thing. But then when you look at the STEM workforce, only a third of the workforce are women. So there's a, a, a disparity there. And um, I think in looking at anywhere from economics to like institutional expectations, uh, with, for example, jobs in academia, I think that affects the retention of women, especially young women in STEM, those who um, have children, especially, and um, women in general in academia are given uh, unequitable uh, service compared to their male counterparts, and that, along with a lot of students feeling very comfortable sharing their burdens, mental health concerns, or any any sort of struggle with women is it, it's hard. Um, it's an additional layer to the job uh, that isn't recognized, and women are also given poor evaluations than their male counterparts when we're talking about. Uh, teaching in the classroom as well. And all of that impacts 
their overall um, trajectory through academia. And so even though things are looking better, I think that uh, there definitely are disparities and we are at a point where I think we're all acknowledging the, uh, the burden that women have had to carry in uh, academia and just in industry. I think we saw it in the pandemic um, where more women had to um, carry the burden of taking care of their families. And so, you know, when women were um, having to deal with doing homework, making sure that their, their kids were yeah. um, getting, you know, the schooling that they needed, their work kind of suffered, you know, and you could see the unfair burden that they had to carry. So it, it's hard. And I think that a lot has to change in academia to be able to better support women in, in these roles. Um, thank you so much for that, Dr. Gerens, and um, particularly highlighting that though we do have a lot of females that are studying, the progression in the workforce is what is not matching, and that's where the disparity really does come in. Dr. Sean Mills, your point of view? Yes, yeah, so I agree with that, and on top of it is I, I think as you go higher up in the levels, in the positions in industry especially, then you see the difference between male, female. Um, the expectations are different. And again, to Dr. Giddings' point, for women, you know, we usually take the burden of, you know, the, the children, right? Taking care of them. So as you go higher up and the demands of the job gets more, that's where you see a lot of women taking a step back and putting children as a priority rather than the job. Um, so right. there is a big, big difference there. I knew for me personally in my workforce for the company I'm at right now, we do have a large um, portion of women in the different positions. But again, as you go up, you see where it becomes less and less. That's, that's, I almost want to cry a little bit. So, and um, personally, it and just working with a yeah. lot of the women, I, I see that are still pushing their career, a lot of them are burnt out um, because they're trying yeah. to- Yes, I am to be honest with you, I'm, I'm here and I'm wishing that we have more males present to hear this. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we can talk as women, but to, to get um, um, uh, the males to understand the, the struggles and to recognize that, you know, it's not based on a lack of effort, it's circumstances that is just different for both. Um, so let's bring it home um, to the C C C Caribbean. That, um, Dr. Bodner, tell us your point of view. What do you see um, in, in Cahill or in just around you concerning this equality of diversity? Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I also pull some statistics. So I think I started off by mentioning that when we joined staff in 2004, there were no females in chemistry. By the time we got to about, let's say, 2010, we were now four females, four males. Like I said, KFIL is a small contingent, small staff in chemistry specifically. So now fast forward to 2023, there are actually more females than males because of retiring. So as we <laughs> have had a few, few of, two of our staff members, have the males have actually retired. Um, and we have not gotten to the point of replacing them quite yet. So we're actually now four to two. But I also pull some statistics for chemistry, Department of Biological and Chemical, which of course expands beyond chemistry. And then also because I'm dean of all of science, I wanted to pull figures about the student population and the staff contingent in the entire faculty. So in computer science, math and physics, and I know that we know where I'm going, there are only two females with about 20 or so males, one in computer science and one in renewable energy in the physics department. Well, physics discipline. In terms of students, we also have a larger percentage of females in chemistry. So we're about 75% of our students are, are female to 25. In the entire biological and chemical sciences, we are 71% female. Computer science, math, and physics, 
has 76% male. So while we are having this conversation, of course, about chemistry, a wider conversation has to be about females in STEM, women in STEM, and in particular, because our largest enrollment is in the computer science, math, and physics department, then we overall are one of the few faculties on campus that has more males than females in science. Even though my classroom oftentimes has very few males. What am I seeing changing? So yes, we are now equaling out the number of staff members that are faculty members that are females. But last year we had only our first ever professor in chemistry. Okay, take it a step further. But we were almost a predominantly female administration of the faculty, a female dean, a female head of biological and chemical sciences, a female deputy dean, and a female head of computer science, math, and physics. But in terms of what Marvadine talked about, in terms of what really will get us promotion, in other words, being able to execute and, and, and publish, et cetera, we're seeing that really only a few of us have been able to, to master that balance between the two to the level of being awarded at the level of professor. And for the time that I have been at UWI, Cave Hill, I only know of three now. One, like I said, was awarded last year. And prior than that, two female professors at Cave Hill. Now I know Mona doesn't have that quite same reality. You have Helen Jacobs, et cetera. So you have all those chemists in particular that were female profs, but it really is quite rare here. And yes, all of the challenges that were mentioned in terms of managing A, the limitations that we have with doing good science with limited resources, that's a major one. And then B, managing what we tend to get pulled towards doing at KF Hill, which is you manage well, you, you organize, you're detailed. We like that for administrative roles. And then maybe C, dealing with our family in no particular order, my A, B, C. So we're not there yet, but we're making strides. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm glad to see the improvement, at least in the, the chemistry arena, but disappointed that, you know, we, we still have to, to reach. Not disappointed, we have hope. There's <laughs> hope for us still in trying to get that across the entire STEM versus just chemistry alone. Um, Dr. Singh, I know you always have like a wealth of things to share with us. So um, what have you noticed? What have you seen um, where you are in UWI at Jamaica? All right, so I, I think um, Janice has represented some of what is going on in the Caribbean, which we share in common. I, um, I start by saying this, um, when we look at the, the academy and what it takes to do science in the region, um, we see why we have very few females at the highest level. So while the global problem is women in science are a minority, the Caribbean overall is, is not looking like that anymore. And in a couple of years, it's even going to get worse. So when we have the conversation, I think, about diversity and inclusion, global women's breakfast, every proposal you write nowadays, um, it, you know, it's a global priority, women in STEM. And if you're not doing something to promote girls in STEM, then it seems to have no value. Um, uh, the Caribbean, however, if we're gonna deal with diversity and inclusion on evidence, we, we should not forget our boys. Our boys are in more trouble in the Caribbean at this moment than our girls. And in a couple of years, if we continue like this, it's going to get worse. As we've said, where the problem is, is, is women at the highest levels in the academy. So certainly in Jamaica, for instance, in the entire science faculty, we're looking at um, about 23 professors, 14 males and nine females. So that's 39% females and 61% males. But if you look at what's going on at the undergraduate level, just like in Barbados, and I have some, um, data I'm talking about for 2020, 
122 and 2223 uh, graduation cohort. If we look at what the numbers are saying, um, our registration numbers at the undergraduate level in five of seven science disciplines, we have girls outnumbering boys by a lot. Biochemistry, 76.6% to 23.4% to, to graduated during that time. 68.2% females to 31.8% uh, males in chemistry. In geography, geology, 71.9% to 28.1%. Females is at 71.9%. 84.9% females to 15.1% males in the life sciences. And mathematics at Mona campus in Jamaica is 52.9% females to 47.1% males. It's physics like in Barbados, and computing that are the only two where we have we have graduated more fee we are graduating more females than males 43.1% for computing and 56.9% are males whereas it's 39 about 40% females to 60% um, males in physics so the, so we can see then that the pool that we're going to take our, our, our science leaders, our professors from, in another couple of years, we do not have any males. <laughs> and, that, and that again is a problem. When we talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, we cannot limit this and, and, and the globe. Those of you who are here from organizations outside of the Caribbean, those of you who are here from say the Ministry of Science, or the NCST, those of you who have policy making, policy making abilities in this region need to recognize that diversity is not just about females and that we have to get closer to addressing the problems in each demographic group before we can really catalyze diversity and inclusion. We, we, are, we are also just talking now about gender. We're not talking about how our laboratories, whether in our high schools, universities, or the research programs are not set up for students with disabilities, for faculty members with disabilities. How do we consider when we are employing a faculty member with a disability, when we, are, we don't have the infrastructure? And then, and then guys, I want to say seriously, unless we begin to address the infrastructure for the teaching and learning of science of STEM and for research in STEM in this region, we are not going to accomplish any catalysis of diversity and inclusion. And that's the reality. Now let's look at what is happening with this business of funding research for all, uh. research for all. Because that is the problem that is, that is the main problem, I would say, that is limiting. Because all of the mentorship issues you see, when, when, when you see what is happening with, in athletics, for instance, where people see Usain Bolt and Shelly Ann Fraser Price and all our Caribbean athletes doing so well and making a life from this, then every school and every organization want to invest in the infrastructure to develop athletics. And now every week there's a developmental meet. Young people are not seeing us as scientists making that good life. Young girls and young boys alike. Our right. research is at the fundamental level and not able to translate to innovation because we have to be moving. And I just share one thing, Rachel, before I stop here. I'm on sabbatical because of all of these other things that we do. I want to do some research and have about three papers lingering for how many years. I went to the US to do some work on my samples because the machinery is not here. I shipped 50 samples from George Washington University where I, where I do some work to the University of North Carolina where I was at at the time. All 50 of them, FedEx said, got lost. And oh, they are very sorry. 
and put in a claim. The claim they want to pay me for this is 100 US dollars because the shipment was not insured. Now, when, when these programs that OWSV and TWAS and UNESCO and these fellowships for women to go and people to go from, from developing countries like ours and study and for three months and then come back, come back to what? Come back to what? To sit with my samples till I get another sabbatical, to then ship them for them to get lost. How do I reach the point of innovation? So this is what I'm so glad that you have started to go into, um, Dr. Singh, is in terms of the challenges that is actually met. And I like that you have broadened the scope of diversity to just go beyond just gender with men and women, um, with women to include the disparity that we're seeing with men as well and the risks that we have there, as well as those who, um, who, are, this, who are differently able in order in us to be inclusive of them as well. And we actually will share a little video later concerning um, chemistry for students who um, are hearing impaired. So, but just to get in into these challenges, we had mentioned um, uh, challenges with, with family, um, we had mentioned challenges with resource and the systems in place, the equipment. Um, what exactly is the uh, other the, um, challenges that you have seen have presented itself with science, whether it is with race, with gender, disability, and, and how has these challenges changed throughout the years? Now, we are short on time, and we have a lot more questions. So if I can ask persons to be a little more concise with their responses so that we can get more in um, so again, what are what are some challenges? You all have mentioned some already, um, but what are some more the challenges? And I'll start with the persons in the Caribbean and make our way out. Um, so Dr. Singh, um, challenges that you had mentioned, you had mentioned um, equipment, um, what else? Okay, so um, let's talk about opportunities for scholarships to study in, um, in, in, in STEM in the region. Opportunities for scholarships uh, are now very rare postgraduate funding, for instance, at the UWE Mona, no new scholarships uh, last semester from the university. Research and publication grant has now gone from, there was a cap, I think, last year to none right now. Uh, the principal had a research um, a new initiatives grant that young people coming on with a new project could apply for. That's no more. And then let's go outside of the university. When you go outside of the university to developmental and funding organizations, for instance, like TWAS, the World Academy of Sciences used to give a grant that was available for, for uh, people in our part of the region. And a couple of years ago when Jamaica was removed and other Caribbean countries, there's a list you see of s and lagging countries. And that list has 66 countries, 45 of which are least developed countries and another 21, which are s and lagging. Can you guess how many Caribbean countries are on that list? There is only one. Which one is it, everybody? Put that in the chat for me, please. Which one is it? And I don't have much time, so let me just... It's Haiti. So we have to be as bad as Haiti before we can qualify. And certainly, they have to use some indicators. Now, we have to think that you know, we are in leadership positions too. With limited resources, they themselves have to think about how they allocate these resources. But the truth is that, you know, as I said, when we deal with diversity, we have to be evidence driven. And there cannot be this global approach when each region, each demographic group has a different set of problems. So when you come closer to the Caribbean, Jamaica, for instance, oh, we benefit a lot from remittances. Everybody has a cell phone. And yes, and then that makes us s and not lagging. When the, 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 the international report from PISA just told us that our students are, are, are failing in science and mathematics in this country called Jamaica, and yet we are not s and lagging, when there are no labs, not even at the university level and instruments to do research. In a, in a university like the U University of the West Indies, where we are the center of innovation, when you look at Caribbean, uh, Caribbean spirit, you see people, here's what's happening. The UA, in, in the UNESCO report 2021, 
nearly all CARICOM countries, more than 80% of the papers published in all Caribbean countries, except Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago have, have um, foreign co-authors, 80% of the, the papers. In Jamaica, the figure is 68%. And in Trinidad and, and Tobago, it's um, 58%, right? And, and what that says to you is that we can't do this research without the support from the people overseas in the US and so, all right? But what that also says to us, Rachel, is that we are not even cooperating with ourselves to overcome our problems. Yes, so that is what I was going to ask because you would see a lot of times that they would endorse these collaborations, particularly ones that are abroad, that you do these collaborations. So how does that, I'm so sorry to interrupt you with that, but that jumped out of my mind immediately that they always tell us, okay, no, try to see if you can get some foreign collaborations, broaden your scope, widen your experience. Um, is, is, is that limiting us in terms of our local collaborations and what we can do um, as, 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 a, as a regional body? Is it lim limiting us as well? No, it shouldn't limit us. 2% of publications from CARICOM researchers have intra-CARICOM collaborators. You know what limits us with collaborating with ourselves? And we have a project right now. It's called CRYSTAL. We are setting up a, a, a regional X-ray crystallography hub. And I think we can do that better as Caribbean people and with the help of people like Leslie and Camille who are in the diaspora. We can do research together, but we have a mentality as Caribbean people you know, that limits us. We are our biggest inhibitor in that partnership. And, and I'm gonna stop there so, so everybody else can get a, a chance. So I've said, in addition to the, to the uh, research infrastructure, we have a problem with accessing the funding both locally and internationally, even and responding to what the data are saying. The data right. are not in us. And yet in Jamaica's vision 2020, 2030, we say that science and technology is one of the major pillars for development and sustainable development. And Jamaica only puts 0.06% of its GDP towards right. s and so, um, so Dr. Badnock, um, I'm seeing questions going up. So Dr. Badnock, what are your thoughts in terms of the challenges? Um, Dr. Singh had added, um, funding, she had added, added that local collaboration. What do you think are some of the other challenges that well, we would be facing with diversity? So before we even get to the other challenges, let me re really support what Marvadine said and bring it home to Barbados, which is, I believe, in an even more interesting position because we really don't qualify for most of those international grants. So they see Barbados as far too developed. And yet, as far as I am aware of, our government puts nothing directly towards science and technology from as a part of their GDP. Even for publications, yeah. Mm -hmm. No. So we're having the same issues in terms of scholarships lagging. So you're not going to be able to attract quality grad students. And she spoke about the research infrastructure, but I want to hone into our actual physical infrastructure on the Cateville campus is woefully lacking and in need of a complete revitalization. And we've gotten far in terms of reaching out and getting a consultant in and giving us a vision. And yet we're probably gonna need some upwards of about $50 million to move. And we are not getting any commitment currently, working on it still, to say start at least phase one half. I can't even call it the full phase, but start something. So we have all of those challenges. Um, my, my deputy dean who's in the chat did mention something that I, I want to stress again. So yes, we're going to look for foreign collaborators because they have funds. And let me just also say, inter-Caribbean travel is horrific. And so for me to get to Jamaica <laughs> just before inter-Caribbean actually launched their direct flight, I had to go to Miami. Well, I might as well have a collaborator in Miami before I can even get to Jamaica. So COVID didn't help this one bit because we became even more fragmented. Totally support the idea that we are our worst enemies. We definitely tend to act as if our own priorities must trump everyone else. And we need to find a way to say, let's put aside and come together. But specifically, I'm going to say something that will be slightly controversial for Cave Hill. 
yes, I, I think I benefited from females around the campus that would have been very encouraging. I can't really say that I had a chemistry specific mentor or a science specific mentor. There was no one, and, and I do, I, I, I really must, must say that Professor Winston Tinto, who passed recently, really yes. was instrumental in getting me to the campus. But I still don't believe that I, and I believe many of my colleagues, really can point to a single or a group of people that they said mentored them. And then that was missing especially at, in the academic space. Yes, I had a mentor at grad school. Yes, I had a mentor that, you know, broadly still collaborated with me. But in terms of somebody who helped me navigate the science at UWI, that was missing. And I am still not, even though we're working on it, really feeling as if the females on the campus have come together and are working together or at least are not working at odds with each other in order to progress. So we need to work on that. And like I said, it might not be something that we wanna admit, but that's the reality. What I will also say is that while we have the experience of seeing a first female principal on the campus, and I think just before she retired, she did a really good job of pulling together people and talking them and telling, telling us about you know, her experiences, we still feel as if senior administration, the governments are not aware of what it takes to do science here. And we as females and maybe as males or maybe just as scientists, I don't know that we are speaking to the right people. I don't know who the right people are. Because I, I can't say that we're not speaking loudly because I think we're speaking loudly, but maybe we just not speaking to the right people to really impress upon them that you cannot get the successes and innovation you want at a national level unless you invest in basic research that drives the innovation. Instead, we want the output and we want it in the term of our political career. So that means now for now but we don't want to invest in a long-term strategy that says this is how we're gonna go ahead. And if Barbados, and I dare say the Caribbean and the UWIs are going to progress, we need to get the governments to be really cognizant of what it's gonna take for us to drive innovation through basic science research. So those are some challenges I think that jumped out at me that weren't mentioned before. Right, and I like that you brought in that um, uh, the infrastructure not qualifying for grants, and even that um, controversial comment concerning um, even lack of that collaboration within your own institution. Um, I wouldn't even just describe what it would say. Sometimes it would say like market crab. <laughs> I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with that, but sometimes people okay. are just trying to climb on top with this, trying to work together and boost each other up. Yes, um, so Dr. Giddens and Dr. Sean Mills, um, I'll start with Dr. Sean Mills. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of the challenges that you see with diversity? So one of the biggest challenges for me is looking more at the foundation. So high schools. So for some communities, they don't have as much availability for the sciences, the teachers to teach them the resources, so that limits for a certain demographic a lot more than others, right? And, you know, I apologize. I've moved away from Jamaica for a long time now, but I know when I was back in high school, it was only a limited set of um, students that could do sciences. And that was because we had limited number of science teachers and also limited number of resources in the lab. So in third form, I remember, you got to take one term of each science, so chemistry, physics and biology, and it depended on how well you did, only a select number of students could progress with the sciences, which from that point on, it's very difficult to then continue if you did not get selected initially. And I think that was a big limitation for a lot of students. They were not able to pursue sciences, even if they were interested, because the availability of teachers and of the resources were not there. So I think that was a big challenge. I don't know if it's changed 
recently, but I know even here in the US, that's still a, a problem for certain, certain areas, right? So I think that's a big one. And also just having that mentorship for those students as well to help, you know, to encourage. I was very fortunate with that where, you know, unlike Janice, in undergraduate, I had, you know, some influence there, as I mentioned, that chemistry professor that kind of guided me in that direction. So that's another big part as well, having those mentors out there for those students who initially have a difficult time or are more limited. And I know when I started working in the labs and in industry, I was just in shock with how much waste there is. We have all these disposable, you know, pipettes, different things. And I just remember being in the lab at Immaculate where we had our glass pipettes and we had to mouth pipette and share that, you know, if you broke one, oh, you know, that was like devastating because there wasn't that much resource. And then I moved to the US and we're just tossing everything. Use it one time, toss, and we had boxes of it. And I tried to look into how can I get these things back to Jamaica? So many, you know, schools would benefit from this. And it was almost impossible for me to be able to take that and send it back. Instead, it just had to go in the trash. And I thought, you know, that was just tragic to me, knowing the limited resources we had in certain communities. Uh, Dr. And, sorry, and I'm, I'm very brief when oh, I, I do <laughs> my responses. So apologize you know, if you need more, but um, that's, no, that's my no. biggest thing right now. Really and truly, I think we, we, we tend to overlook the foundation at the beginning and really get them back to the high schools so that we can have students who are capable and have the equipment they need to do the science is what is, is very crucial. Um, Dr. Giddens? I do wanna agree with what was said in terms of there just needing to be a stronger foundation, STEM foundation for students. I see it on an undergraduate level where uh, we're not able to graduate enough students because we lose them uh, in our introductory classes in college. That's, I think, a big leaky pipeline that we could fix to, um, increase our numbers. Uh, when looking at just the profession of being a chemist on a whole, I think that right now we're in a critical time where I think the pandemic and the resulting inflation has really illuminated challenges for women and underrepresented groups. Um, I had mentioned before about us seeing the burden that women take on with families, being the primary caretakers, especially in the pandemic. But now we see like inflation driving many people out of places like academia, where uh, we're already kind of underpaid for the work that we do in terms of the hours of work that we do. Uh, more graduate students are going into industry where they can have a nine to five job and make a decent living. Um, I think people are looking for better quality of life. Um, I think childcare is increasingly expensive. I don't know what it's like in, in the Caribbean, but over here it's another mortgage. And that is something that really um, contributes to people reevaluating their career choices. Um, just also trying to manage a family and um, having a demanding job at the same time is hard. And now we see women getting tenure and getting promoted, but then leaving academia because they can't sustain that level of, of juggling. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think economics and just overall burnout is, um, definitely highlighting the need for change. And I think that many more people are on board with at least acknowledging that there's a problem and now we need to change the policies, the institutional policies to better support people. Right, so in, you had mentioned um, STEM not being that attractive to high school students on the paid childcare. So, you guys had actually made it to where you are. You guys are, are highly regarded within your field. I'm going to combine the number of questions because of time. We were supposed to finish at 9.30. So I'm going to combine questions and just ask you guys if you guys can speak for two minutes. Um, and I'm going to throw like about four questions at you. And then you can choose how you which ones you want to answer 
with any two minutes, so I can give time for the audience to throw their questions. So in the chat, you would have seen that I, I'm so glad that you guys are also corresponding with in the chat panelists. And you all talked about encouraging the regional collaboration and then take, taking that internationally as well to boost the fund funding. Um, Dr. Mitchell, I talk about the Association of Science Teachers. Um, Dr. Mavdeen, you came back to yeah, the UNESCO funding. And we also had a mention of mentorship. So what are some of the resources? Um, you all had mentioned mentorship. You all had mentioned um, Dr. Strong. I think he even had mentioned resources, like when you went abroad, resources across there versus what we have locally. What, uh, so again, I'm gonna list the questions. Um, what is the, the resources? What was the strategies that got you to where you are? Um, are there more structures in place now compared to then to help women in science or men in science? So um, just being a catalyst of diversity to um, do, what are the structures in place that can help catalyze diversity now? And what advice would you give um, to young persons who are starting their career? And then I'll ask each person for just two minutes so that we can just um, open for more questions from the audience um, that would be maybe a little bit more personal. And we wrap up at 10 a.m. absolute latest. Okay, um, Richard, so I'm let me start. Okay, no problem. So um, I think, uh, so where I am now, I don't think I'm anywhere. I don't think I'm that awesome, I tell you the truth, because I have a lot to do in my research. Um, but but one of the things that have helped me um, to, to to get some attention is to go internationally with my voice to advocate for health for the region. So when I got involved with TWAS, I spoke and people listened. And then I got involved with the formation of Commonwealth Chemistry. And then I'm now involved with the setting up of a greater Caribbean light source for the Caribbean. And I'm also involved with, with LAMP and with, C, with IUPAC. So go, go internationally and use your voice to get attention because I find in the Caribbean, our leaders respond to, um, to the international voices much more than they, 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 they respond to us. And then I also think it has to go with organizing ourselves as a, as a, as a region. Uh, because I think if we go as a Caribbean region, small island developing states in the region, we are, so I have a nice, uh, interaction with my colleagues in Trinidad and Barbados and St. Lucia and all over the place um, for efforts. Um, I, I also, because you know, you have given us very little time, I have to say to young people that they must um, be clear about what they want and go after it. So if you can find your passion and you're gonna, it, it's gonna take me a while to meet with each of you, talk to people, um, who can help you explore opportunities, keep reading. There are some opportunities, people. We have to look for them. I bring you a couple. The light sources for Africa, the Americas, Asia, the Middle East, and the Pacific. That's called LAMP. LAMP has some funding for faculty and staff teams. Every October is the deadline for application. I need more of us in the Caribbean. To apply to go to one of these light sources, synchrotrons, and, and with your students and get some exposure to develop some of your projects. Um, I have, we have some funding opportunities that come through us yes, to the Royal have, Society of Chemistry. A few of them, if I may interrupt, do you mind when we are finished to type in as many as you can with any chat? Because a lot of times it's because persons don't know or are aware. If you can right. put them in the chat when you finish, that would be quite helpful. So, so, so becoming members of, of academies like uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, American Chemical Society, getting involved with IUPAC, getting involved with the Caribbean Academy of Sciences and calling on the leaders of CAS to build a stronger regional academy and then we can become a voice. We need to also get more involved um, in calling for CARICOM leadership in STEM. There used to be, Grenada is in charge of CARICOM, but when Keith Mitchell left office, we no longer hear of any activity. Um, so those are what I'm gonna leave with you. But before I go, let me also just, just, um, just say this. Guys, <clears throat> it is very, very important 
that our leaders who are here, if anybody in the faculty leadership and university leadership, for instance, are here, can we sit down and look at the path to promotion and how we treat with young staff members who are coming in, who are thrusted into these leadership positions? Should some of these positions be taken up by professors who already have attained um, the outstanding contributions mm -hmm. in their research programs and then give a, a one or a two years in the beginning. And then I said, finally, but finally, there is a regional mentorship STEM program, which we started in 2022, launched on International Day for Women and Girls in Science. OWSD and Elsevier Foundation were involved. We started it with no funding. Um, it's a it's a walking in our footsteps, it's called, and it was launched in Jamaica. UNESCO came on board last year. We got some funding and we have the girls spending. They get a stipend to spend a week in the lives of their mentors. They work on a STEM-based community projects project together. They get mentorship for the execution of the project. They get mentorship for building relationships with their mentors. Uh, they get uh, to go on STEM tours in the country. Trinidad is gonna be is was running and, and Trinidad will also be benefiting and we're trying to build this out in the region. Walking in his footsteps, we are launching this year because the Caribbean has a, a male problem, but um, UNESCO global priority is women in science. And we're starting that with just um, people who volunteer, no funding at all, but that's also coming and we can work together to spread this across the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. And don't forget, please, to make a list of those you had mentioned. IOPAC is the Ezra study, um, the organization with the, with the um, if I go to list them all, I will probably take up too much time. But if you can list some of them so that persons, uh, students, or who in the audience will be aware of what is present and what they can access. Dr. Giddens, I know your time with us is short. Um, could you um, give us again, what are some of the, how, what are the systems that got you there? Are there more things in place now uh, that you're aware of that, um, that young science system actually use to catalyze their development in STEM? And if you can also give advice to anyone in high school, what would it be? I think um, one of the main themes that was echoed today is finding great mentors. Um, I think that that was key for my success in chemistry. And not only finding mentors within your field, but you can have mentors outside of your field as well to give perspective, which sometimes you lose when you're facing a challenge. Um, I think developing a strong network of peers who are supportive, who you can turn to, with you know, either uh, science problems or just the bureaucratic problems you face at work. Um, I found people at conferences, so get involved in your professional societies. Um, for students out there, um, perhaps you don't feel like a professional society is, um, is for you just yet, but sometimes universities have local chapters uh, for graduate students and undergraduates to you know, get involved. I know that the American Chemical Society has, um, has chapters that, that students can participate in and just get introduced to the idea of what a professional society is, because I know it can be very overwhelming. Um, join committees you know, get get involved. Um, and I think the most important thing is to not lose sight of who you are and the value that we all bring to the table, because I think that can also get lost as we're facing a challenge. And I think, you know, you get a lot of advice, not all advice is good advice, but you take the advice that resonates uh, the most with you and your core values, right, as a person. And I think moving forward, um, the advice I would give to, for example, high school students um, is, you know, just to have fun. Uh, have fun with science, be creative, find cool ways of communicating your science to others, because a major problem that we face 
as scientists is not being able to communicate effectively with the public. And we saw that in the pandemic and, you know, we just need to uh, better show people how science is involved in every part of their life, right? And, um, and so, you know, it's not just a thing for nerds. This is a, a way of, that we've managed to, to live, you know, science helps us do every aspect of our day-to-day -day, um, jobs and in our lives. So I would just say, you know, be creative, have fun with science and share that with the world. Thank you so much for that. Um, that is such a core value because that's why I did chemistry. I love science. Um, so Dr. Giddens, I know that you have to take your leave. So when you can, you can leave. But thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your insights value so much. Um, Dr. Sean Mills and Dr. Bad Badmuff, of course, I'll ask you guys to be concise and tight because I know you guys have so much to share. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. But again, um, what is your advice? Um, how did you get here? What are the systems in place? What are your advice for, for young scientists? So maybe I can start off, Camille. Sure. I, I'll try not to repeat anything that was said before. So I think all the mentorship applies. So I'm going to hone in on the question about young, young students, young interested people in STEM. I think in Barbados and in the Caribbean, there are more opportunities as a young person to take part in things like coding camps, robotic camps, spice being run from the Caribbean Science Foundation. There are these opportunities that we probably would have clawed our way to get to be a part of when we were younger. The exposure is tremendous, but we don't always have a lot of students knowing about it. And we don't always have a lot of students taking up or telling themselves, why not them? We tend to suffer from imposter syndrome. We don't all have the confidence from a very stable family. So I think we need to find a way to promote some of these opportunities to the disenfranchised, the, the, the students that are underrepresented across the region, if we're talking specifically about the region. We've got to find a way to make time, to spend a little bit more time in the schools. And in that way, what they see is a person who has utilized science to make a living. And I think that we've been working in Barbados on an agricultural project, even though St. Augustine is, is, is the home of the Faculty of Agriculture. But one of the things that our new director in one of our centers keeps saying is about making agriculture sexy. And that's how you're going to get interest. Well, I want to expand it. Let's make science sexy. Let's show <laughs> them that you can make a career that makes good money with science. But then let's also show them how they can acquire the tools. Let's work in a very conscious and deliberate and intentional way to really improve our math skills in our schools. Because that I believe will then be the fundamentals for everything else. But more importantly, let's teach them that science is fun. Let's show them, maybe teach is not the right word, but let's show them it is fun and encourage them to find their passion in science. And maybe, Somewhere along the lines, we can change a lot of lives, showing them that the development can come out of innovations from science. Everything else that was said, I definitely 110% echo. We need a more intentional network that speaks about these funding opportunities and that we share them as scientists when we come across them. But all of those have been stated before. Marvadine said a great job. She really outlined what we should do. So I'll stop And here. she has listed some of them in the chat. So for Absolutely. our audience who are here, please take a look at some of the organizations that Dr. Singh had listed to get information. Dr. Barnett, thank you so much for that insight. I think young, um, the younger generation these days are a bit more hesitant to be involved and stretching that and, um, and emphasizing that need to get involved in as much activities. This is also emphasized by Dr. Giddings by getting involved with the, in the organizations, the institutions, that we need to get involved when op opportunities do come across. Um, so thank you so much again for that insight. Dr. Sean Mills? Yeah, so I would say for the younger generation, the biggest thing is to look into all the opportunities reaching out to others in the field, whether it's in specifically your field, but in the sciences, reaching out and trying to get that network 
Um, when you build a network, then it eventually leads to hearing about all the opportunities or getting advice from those who are already in that career. You know, I think a big part of it is speaking to some of those people. Perhaps what you're thinking it really is, isn't exactly the reality of things. Spending some time, if you can even volunteer, you know, looking into those opportunities, whether it's volunteering, it's much easier to get that time um, by volunteering as opposed to looking specifically for a job, right? So when you volunteer, you get that exposure on what is out there. You get to work with those people in the field. Um, again, those people can help advise you. For me, the biggest thing for my progression in my field was those um, the networking that I did and yeah. the people I met during that way. So as I mentioned, I did the postdoctoral fellow you know, I took it because I was following my passion. So that's another thing. I followed my passion. I met a lot of people during that time, interacted with them, and they gave me advice on career paths. And I followed that for those who aren't 100% sure of what they want to do. You know, that's a good one as well. So you follow your passion, you meet people, you learn more. And as you expose yourself to more, it helps to guide you in that area where maybe that's where you should be if you're not 100% sure about it. But I think it's that connection that you make networking and being able to get that advice and knowing all the opportunities. When I started um, as an undergraduate, I didn't know the opportunities. And as I explored, there were different scholarships out there that I wasn't aware of initially. There were people that I met that helped me to point me in those directions because I didn't find it on my own. You can't find everything on your own. And I think a big thing that will help the sciences is for those who are already established in the field to just give up some of your time. So even if it's not just the money part, just the time to meet with some of these people who are pursuing careers or thinking about pursuing careers, to give that time, you know, whether it's to help tutoring for those who are struggling um, when I just started, I used to work in the minority office at the university where you gave your time and you just tutor these students. So where we pointed out that a lot of these students fell out within the first year or two, having those programs help those students, you help them to appreciate the sciences where they were struggling before, and then they decide to pursue that. So I think giving up time, networking, those are big ones to help improve the field. Sorry, Rachel. Oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I I saw, one uh, quick suggestion mm -hmm. here as, a, as an outcome, a direct outcome from this session. I am suggesting that we launch a Walking in Her Footsteps regional program for professional, young professionals in STEM. Um, and we, could, we can link that to the Walking in Her Footsteps program that UNESCO currently funds um, for undergraduate and high school students in Trinidad and Jamaica. And Dr. Singh, I would say that you are exactly on point because one of the personal questions I had is that coming from this, what are some of the networking and mentorship pro pro programs that we can actually um, develop from this that will actually help um, catalyze that, that, that diversity, but catalyze persons' interest, their career, their pathway into science and into STEM? So I had actually, there's two of my questions, actually, in terms of if mentorship could be provided as well as networking. Um, so that would be great if that can come up with that. And um, a lot of persons are busy, but if we can try to, to give time towards putting that, I'm talking to myself with that, um, to give time towards that networking. Um, I do have, there's one question from someone, um, I think Latoya, I had lost it in the chat. Um, Latoya had talked about having issues. Um, and Dr. Uh, Singh, I saw that you had attempted to ask to answer a question where she talks about as a biotechnologist, she struggled with finding a mentor in that area as most scientists she interact with in chemistry or biology. Any, any advice? And I will answer that partially is that one of the advice that I got is that a mentor does not really have to be in your area or field. And sometimes when you do have a mentor who may be outside of your field, you do get a, a different perspective in terms of how you can advance yourself. Um, does anyone have anything else to add to that question? Dr. Badnock, Dr. Singh, Dr. Shant, in that order? Anything to add to the question of mentorship? Yeah, 
of having yeah, a mentorship in are, your field? We're going to deal with Latoya directly. I'm speaking with her on direct messaging right now, and we are going to get her some connection with uh, with a mentor. Um, so Great. that one, we will deal with that directly, and um, she'll be fine. I'm okay, gonna put my, right. my phone number right here. So but as, as well talk. as not just the toy, there may be others as well who uh, have this question about mentorship and trying to find mentors. So if anyone right. else who in the chat, you have this concern or if it is that you're looking for mentors, you can leave your name within the chat and they will try to connect with you. Please take note of the email addresses that was left like Dr. Gail Giddens left her email address. For those who are looking for collaborations on networking, please take note of these addresses so that you can use it after. So, Rachel, um, let's I support see... what you said, Rachel, because it is true mm -hmm. Latoya, that your mentors don't have to be in the same area. I told you guys before about Professor Roy. You know, uh, and Professor Roy is in biotechnology, I'm in chemistry, and this lady just, you know, um, has been so awesome in my life, you know, so um, there are so many others too. So we, but but as I said, we're going to deal with Latoya and get her to speak with some outstanding women in STEM and in biotechnology. Yeah. So from this, we will get, um, try to work on getting some listings, some networking done. Are there any questions again from the audience? I'll give you guys just uh, two minutes for that. And then we have a short video. Um, any other questions? Um, while they type that out, if I can just ask one brief question. Um, you guys had talked a lot about um, the struggles in terms of getting in your career. And one of the things that has been promoted from particularly to my generation is that women can have it all. But it seems like there's so many sacrifices that have to be made. Um, what are some of the sacrifices you have yourself for those who want to answer? You have seen that women had to make in their career. Um, what was the cost to them? And, um, and um, what else? Sorry. Yes. And is it possible? <laughs> to have it all and what is, what cost would it come at? So I can start with that one <laughs> because that <laughs> resonates with me. Um, I think right now, I think for a lot of the women, the cost is themselves. So as an example, myself and others in my field that I speak with all the time, you know, we try to do everything for work. So we get our work done. Then at the end of the day or whenever it is, you spend the time with your children. And then when you're done with them, then you go back to whatever it is for career. So for me, you know, I start work early and in the evening when my daughter comes home, gets her to her, her activities, try to spend as much time with her. Once she got to bed, then I would get more work done and then start over. And that's, you know, the cycle that I was doing for a long time and still do. I'm trying to cut back now, trying to um, find that work-life balance. But the cost really at the end of the day was myself, you know, the stress, wow. you're exhausted all the time trying to do everything, you're doing everything, but you just burn yourself up completely. Um, and at some point, you know, it takes its toll. But as women, we were able to hold that burden for a long time and we keep it going. So I think a lot of us, that's the biggest struggle right now. And, you know, just dealing with ourselves and being able to cut off when we need to. And um, when you look at the men, a lot of the times, you know, they go to work, they put their time in, they may do some extra, but the child caring part isn't as much on them. So they get that downtime where with women, we don't get it as much and we sacrifice our time or health by not getting the exercise we should, et cetera. So I think that's the biggest thing for us that I've seen. So Rachel, I'll jump in. my diary. <laughs> Let, let me jump in and say, can we? Can you have it all? You can, but not at the same time. Yeah, exactly. I you can, that. but you'll be sacrificing a lot of yes. yourself. I think. Correct. Yes. So then, so, crucial career planning is it's, it's necessary. Yeah. Crucial planning of career and family is mm -hmm. very necessary yeah. if you want to have it all. You can't have it all at the same time. But right. by the time you sit back after thirty years or so and look back. Um, and then truth is that many women who are outstanding in science choose not to have children. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, we don't, the, the truth is that we have to be clear about what it is we want out of life. Each of us has a different priority. If that that's what makes you happy and you don't want children, mm -hmm. go for it. And if you are okay with, with, with you know, 
prioritizing your children and settling with just being a lecturer and never get to senior lecturer or professorship and you're happy with that go for it find what makes you happy if I you want to excel as a as a teacher as a lecturer and a teacher and your students are your priority go for it and be happy with it um you gotta make a living so you know you got to get some pay <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> what I'm saying, find what makes you happy and don't let the system force you into feeling that you're less than if you never right. make it to senior lecturer or professorship, right. Right. or if you never choose to be a mother. All of us needs different things to make right. us happy. And end of the day, that's what makes us awesome. We find happiness and peace. And that's and the thing I'm 24, so Rachel. Glad, yes. You but you 24, said that Go ahead, sorry, for 2024, let's try to be healthier. I think let's walk more because that was a big thing on my campus. And we just said, look, we're gonna form a little fitness group. We walk in twice, we just stop it. And we're just gonna walk. And eventually maybe it'll get to a run, but we're gonna try to prioritize our health. We're gonna try to prioritize the things that make you also very happy and, and get to bed at a proper hour, Camille, because I know that like- Well, no, so 2024 four. was my year when I said, okay, I'm done. Okay. I, okay. I've, I've been much happier. You know, even yes. my coworkers notice the difference with, you know, my thought process, the way how I'm discussing things. My memory is way better um, now that I'm doing that. So it's finding that balance. Very good point. <laughs> Very good point. I love yes. it. I, I am so glad you guys, I know we are way past all our time, but this is sometimes what people need to hear. Because one of the things, another question that, that I had in mind is that somehow it never feels like when you try to do everything, you never feel like you're good at anything. Um, because you only could give yourself a piece. So everything gets done in, in pieces versus trying to, and I like that you guys brought your focus back on, you know, what is important, getting your exercise. You're doing that and it's just ringing off my husband. <laughs> it's because of be like, you know, you need to rest. You need to do this. You need to get balance, you know? And I'm so glad that you guys were able to bring that up. Is there any final words that you all have to say? Anything burning within your mind that you want to express? Yes, I want to I want to say this. I want to say that we 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 need to encourage ourselves our graduate students or undergraduate students, everyone we interact with to not compromise quality for quantity. And 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 this is very important because right now I think in even in the world of science and as scientists, you know, we're, we're we we want to publish in high impact factor journals. And so there's some fundamental science that gets left behind because maybe you have to go to more application-based stuff to go to those higher impact. Gotta be, again, I say, gotta be clear about what you, what, what you want to be known for in your life, what, what your impact needs to be, what impact you want to have, and do not compromise quality in everything you're doing for, for quantity. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Bad, um, Bad, not Dr. Sean Mills. Um, I would say, so pursue what your passion is. So as I mentioned previously, find that path where you think you want to be. When you find yourself in a certain role, it doesn't mean that that's the final place. You can explore other options. The sciences, once you do the sciences, there are many options out there to look into, to explore. And I think that's the biggest thing we're all on a path. We don't have a set end point. We can continue from there. We have a lot to learn. Even if you're in your current role right now and you think you know everything, there's always more to learn. You can expand and network. So I think that's a big thing. So for me- so We're having a lot of questions from the audience that's telling you, thank, thank, thank you. Yes, Dr. Badnock? Yeah, so my final thought would be leave it better than you found it. Do your best leave and better leave it found. better than you found it. Yeah. <laughs> so at this time, we just want to show a short video in diversity in science. And this is actually um, a ACS UE chemical festival for the deaf. I was actually a part of that. It was really a great experience. So um, Dr. Brown, are you ready? So guys, we have our video ready. Yes, and I'm we queue in five, four, three.
Is the sound coming through? So uh, thank you so much for that. So from that video, you guys get to witness um, as, as an ACS UWI joint project for chemistry for um, for the hearing impaired. And we had done it at two institutions um, in Trinidad and Tobago. And I can see one of the things of being there is that we had thoroughly enjoyed working with the students. Of course, we had to diversify ourselves a bit in terms of learning a little bit of sign sign language to make that communication easier. However, the excitement that these two, that the children had when it came to doing simple science. And I even talked to, to some of the undergrads that were there. And I'm like, you guys don't be this excited for chemistry anymore. And they're like, no, Miss the assignments, the lab work, no. And I, but I'm like, you know, this is what you need to get back in, or, in order to push you forward. You have to get back that excitement and joy for chemistry again. It was really a great experience and of course we are looking to expand so if anyone know funding op opportunities we're looking to expand to Tobago and probably to other countries in the region so we want to thank Dr. Uh, Casey for that. Um, so guys um, Dr. Anka Brong if you can keep me in check is there anything else that we need to do? Um, so Dr. Bodmak is saying to our colleagues we need to return to our model where we travel for a few days to another campus have a chat and present where is, and the funding for this as well. We need to get some of the funding for this done as well. <laughs> so guys, thank you so much, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Badnock, Dr. Sean Mills, Dr. Sin Wilmot, you guys had given us such an experience this morning in both the, the information in terms of the organization, the system that in place for support, and the challenges that is actually faced, um, particularly as this is a global women's breakfast, but the challenges that we do face as women in terms of being in the science field and that need to expand diversity, not just with women as well, but with men, with the differently able, um, and just be able to, um, to put, to catalyze ourselves in terms of our own career path, staying true to ourselves. So we want to thank you guys so much for joining us. I also want to thank in particular, uh, Dr. Anka Brong, Dr. Petra Fee who have done an excellent job in putting everything together in this session. Um, even though we know we did have that little start in the beginning, you know, they were quickly to get, get, to get us back on track. I also want to thank everyone that joined us this morning. I know we had pushed way past our time. We were supposed to finish at 9.30 and it's 10, 11, but you guys are still here with us. We thank you for that, and we really hope that you had learned a lot. Please ensure that you get the information from the chat. Get the information, get the connections, get the email addresses, and, see, and take a look at all the organizations and the things that are in place that you can get involved with. So just to stress the persons, do not forget, get involved, expand yourself to network, and let's see what we can do from this global breakfast um, morning that we are going to take this beyond just um, a yearly meeting, but something that we can use to connect with each other on a regular basis to help build and lift each other up. So guys, thank you so much and have a blessed day. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Everyone bye, in the chat, say bye. Great great audience. Bye. bye. <laughs> thank you, everyone.
Rashlini, bye Simon. No problem, that's the bro. Bye, Raquel. <laughs> Dr. Brock, you want to take off the recording? Yes.